Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Last week we, uh, we went through 1 through 17. This week we're going to be in 18 through 32. And this can be a challenging passage of Scripture. There are multiple passages throughout the book of Romans that you look at and just go, hmm. Even Peter did the whole, hmm, when he read some of Paul's writings. It just didn't always connect, didn't always have a clear idea of what Paul was trying to say. And so we're going to jump into a passage this morning that I believe is not directly pointed at the church. I believe it's a word that's directly pointed at our culture and our society um, as a people. You know, one of the things that I think that we get off on a little bit or out of balance in is we think that, hey, we're America. God loves us. We're America, you know, Americans. And I'm extremely patriotic. I love America, all that stuff. But when God looks at human, the human race, he looks at those that belong to him and those that don't. There's his, the family of God and there's those that aren't the family of God. And this morning when I opened my Bible in Mark chapter 3 to read my devos, um, I found it interesting that uh, Jesus' family hears that everybody thinks he's nuts. They're like, this guy's gone, he's gone crazy. So they, you know, in an attempt to go rescue Jesus, they make their way to where Jesus is at and they send word. His mom says, hey, send this message inside and let Jesus know his mom's here. And he says this when they give him the message. They say, he says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my, uh, my sister? Those who do the will of God. And I think the disciples are probably going, I think he's lost it too. Yo, Jesus, it's the one that gave birth to you. That lady, Mary, she's outside. She wants you. But he begins to identify his family at that point. He's setting apart people. Then in Romans chapter 2, around verse 28, we always hear Jew first, then Gentile. Can I tell you something? You know what a Jew is by definition? In Romans chapter 2, verse 28, somebody who does the will of God. It's somebody who's right with God. A true Jew is someone who's right with God. It's not somebody who is born of Jewish descent. In, in that passage, he's talking about that, and he's establishing the family of God. And so it's not about being an American. It's not about being, you know, this blessed nation. It's about being a child of God and identifying with the king of kings. And so as we address this sermon this morning, my question to you is, has God abandoned America? And I think that all of us would have different answers, but let us allow Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 30, 32, answer the question, has God abandoned America? Has God abandoned America? Mankind. Let's jump in here. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He's three trigger points here to God's anger. Sin, wickedness, and those who suppress the truth. And you try to hide the truth from people, I'm going to be ticked off. If you're this, this sinful, this lifestyle of sin ticks me off. Wickedness and evil in the world ticks me off. That's, that's what God is saying, but his anger shows, uh, is shown from heaven against these three main things. Can I just set the record straight for you? Is If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted the free gift of salvation, you are perfect. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not because you're so good and you've attained this level of holiness and you can sit on your high horse and point out all the sin in people's lives. That just makes you hypocritical because you're, we're all sinful, but when we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, God sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ and says, you are the righteousness of God. You're righteous. So when he, as we read this passage, if you've accepted Christ, we're the righteousness of Christ. And in this whole passage really doesn't apply to us in the way that it's being written. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It says this in verse 19, They knew the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. How did God make the truth obvious to mankind? He did it like this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. We have missionaries and unreached people, groups that worship a God. There's something inside of them that drives them to worship 
something because everything around us in creation screams there is a God that designed this. That we didn't just happen to get the formula right and explode into existence and we've evolved from nothing into this something great. That is just a fairy tale. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says that God has put on the inside of every single one of us a seed of faith. You know that it doesn't even take any effort on our part to believe because God has given us the ability to believe. He's given us a seed of faith so that we can believe that there's a loving God that created everything, that there's a designer that designed all this and created it. He's put it on the inside of all of us, and then he's shown us through creation. The thing that I love about science is the fact that the more we learn and the more technical we get, the farther we can go with telescopes and the deeper we can go with microscopes, we begin to see the fingerprint of God on everything that we discover. Used to be a cell was just a simplistic thing. Used to be that DNA was nothing. It is so encoded with information that only somebody who has information to encode it with could have done it. It didn't just happen. Let me show you something. This is, this is pretty powerful right here. This is called a, 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 limit, a, a laminin. And it is a molecule protein. And this molecule protein is like glue in your body that holds all your cells together. Without a laminin protein, without laminin proteins in our body, we would be dead. You would not physically exist. And I find it interesting that it's in the shape of the cross because without the cross of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, we would be dead spiritually without him. And so he's just said, hey, you know what? I think I'll stir things up a little bit. The laminin in your body that's going to carry the cells and hold everything together so that you can exist and breathe and be a human being and have a job and all the other things, I'm going to put it in the form of a cross. Just to remind people that without the cross, without Jesus, without the resurrection, you cannot have forgiveness of sin. And you're separated from God for eternity. I love it. That's what microscopes are doing, doing for us today. If you go out into the uh, outer space in the middle of the, uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, you'll see this thing, M51, and it's a star out there way out in the midst, and he put his fingerprint even to the outermost parts of the uh, outer space in the Whirlpool galaxy, right in the center of it. Why? To say, look, guys, I exist. And as you have telescopes, and as you have all this great technology, the more that you research, the more that you're going to find that everything that I've created screams that I exist. I wish we had more science funded by Christians so that more of this stuff would get out and we could understand that there's a fingerprint of a designer that was intelligent, that created everything that we are, that created everything that we see. And he's saying that in, in Romans chapter 1, he's saying... My creation screams of my existence. Therefore, there is absolutely no excuse for not believing in me as God. Here's another one. They call this the, it's the helix nebula, but they call this the eye of God. I just thought this one was really, really beautiful, so I threw it up there. But throughout creation, you see things that are just powerful, that scream of his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature, the living God. I, here's a painting. Anybody know who painted this? Leonardo da Vinci, 1495. You know, I, I don't think there's ever been an argument about who painted this or whether an artist painted it. I don't think we said, oh, you know what? There's an explosion in an art gallery, and I'll be darned. Look at that. We look at that and go, man, he was a talented painter. And even though he existed over 400 years ago and we've never met him, we've never seen him, we've heard stories about him, we see his work, we see his efforts, so we know there had to be some artist that painted it. It points to the fact that there's an artist who painted that picture. Why? Because of the detail. The detail. No, that, you can't just explode an art museum and get that kind of detail. And yet that picture is nothing compared to your body. When you bar begin to, to look inward at our body and how it functions and all the, the, the things that have to be in place immediately in order for you to exist and to be alive and sustain life, it couldn't have evolved. And, oh, that one's wrong. Oh, evolved. oh finally, boom, got it right. Just like there is, no, there is no artist in the world that would ever agree with you if you told them, hey, it just kind of happened. 
What about this one? It's Adam in the hand of God in creation. Michelangelo in the early 1400s, late 1400s. Uh, Michelangelo painted this picture, and yet today we look at this painting, and we don't just say, ah, oh, it's just a mistake. Oh, it was happenstance. We say, no, there was a painter who spent hours and in his mind had designed for what this painting's going to look like and then painted this picture. Through creation, we see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, and there's no doubt that there had to be a designer when we begin to see his creation. What about this one? If you go up near House on the Rock, he didn't design House on the Rock, but you got Frank Lloyd Wright. And I used to want to be an architect. I, I'm intrigued by a lot of building stuff and, and, uh, and structures. If you ever make it to Tokyo or places like that, there's just some incredible buildings. But when I look at those buildings, I, go, I don't go, ah, yeah, a lumber yard blew up. Carver lumber pff, exploded, and bam, there's a house. Now, I wish that was the case because I'm building a garage right now, and it'd probably be a whole lot easier to blow up a bundle of lumber than to cut everything in detail and with precision put every board in the right place and screw it together so that it can structurally stand the test of time. If you've, I mean, it just, it's frustrating at times. You just look at it and go, oh, it's so much work. And God was so tired after six days that he took a break because he built the universe. He created everything. Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, you, you look at some of his buildings and nobody ever just says, ah, it happened by happenstance. Even though we've never met him, we've never seen him, we know, hey, pff, he designed that. Then he had some skilled laborers that came along and put his design into physical being. Romans 121 says this, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Did you catch that? They wouldn't worship him as God. And so let's watch what happens. And they began to think up foolish ideas. Okay, so they're not worshiping the one true God. So they begin this process of thinking of foolish ideas about what God was like. And as a result, because they did that, their minds became dark and confused. Okay, and so how do people get so far off from the truth? Because their mind is dark and they become extremely confused. Why? Because they've separated themselves. They've removed themselves from the protection of God. They've literally said, I'm not worshiping the God that I know exists based on creation, based on everything I know, based on everything I've been raised with. I refuse to worship God. And so there's this process where our minds become dark, our process where our minds become confused, and then we start going crazy. And we see it in our culture. And so my question is, has God abandoned us? What does it look like when a God, a living God, abandons mankind? We're going to get into a few of those things here in a minute. But I love this verse in 22. It says, claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. You know what? When people, they, they can say big words, and they got big educations, and they got a lot of letters behind their name, and God just stands back and goes, what an utter fool. It's the simplistic things of the gospel that shame the wise. God is a simple God. He's an intrinsic God that we can't understand, but yet he's put it on such a simple level that you and I can understand it and believe it. And he's even given us the faith to believe it. So they, this process, they refused to worship God. They daydreamed and thought up foolish things and ideas about God. Their minds became dark and confused, and ultimately they degraded to utter fools as a result. Literally, mankind has come to the place where they'll worship anything, no matter how stupid it is, as long as they don't have to worship the one true God. Why? Because there's an accountability. Man, we'll give media time to anything, any crazy theology, as long as it isn't Jesus Christ. Why? Because it comes with an accountability of who we are, an identity that people don't want because they've willingly removed themselves. Verse 23 says, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people, birds and animals and reptiles. As I read that, I, I, be, I believe that this scripture right here is directly referencing evolution that's taught in our schools. It used to be taught as a theory. Hey, here's a theory, and here's another theory, and now oftentimes it ends up becoming like, hey, here's, here's a reality of our existence. 
we came from evolution. When you begin to study this stuff, it just doesn't even make sense. You listen to some of these guys that are so smart. I mean, they are intelligent, off the scale intelligent. And one of the guys that I was listening to, I, I, just, I just scratched my head. I thought, this sounds like a Marvel comic. Like, like we're going to go through a porthole and we're going to go to multiple universes and multi, multiverse and all this. This sounds like a Marvel comic. It's just crazy when you think about like Big Bang, like there's this little molecule and it spun really fast and boom, exploded into existence. And, but when you study science, true science, everything revolves in the same direction after an explosion, but we have planets moving in the opposite direction. So that's null and void. How can that be? You know, there's just so many things when you really study this stuff that, but people will believe anything as long as it's not God. They'll put their hope and their trust in craziness. I was talking to a guy about monkeys. I said, dude, so you believe really that we evolved from monkeys? Like, where's the transitional, uh, you know, fossils and stuff like that? I mean, I'd like to see a human with a tail. That'd be pretty cool. And he said, well, before they got to apes, there was a gene split. So then, Apes evolved from the split, one half of the split. and then, It's just like it, it's, it never ends. Things are always changing. The science is always changing. It's like God never changes. I think about the Hindu religion, 300,000 gods. I think about even Mormonism and things like that. And when you begin, I, I had a bunch of guys with me. We went out to Utah and we went to, U, to the Mormon uh, temple. And I'm pointing, not, I'm not pointing at you, Chris. I'm pointing at Seth. He went with me. And we went out there and we began to study about this, this religion. And I just thought, how could somebody follow this? You're going to follow a dude that just was a control freak that wants to have a bunch of wives and have sex with anybody he wants. And, and it's, I, really? Where's the wholeness in that? You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy when you begin to study some of the things that people believe. Christianity, and I've said this before, Christianity is the only one where God, the living God, came down and said, I'll sacrifice myself for mankind. I'll make the way. It's not about you dotting the I and crossing the T and getting the formula perfect in order to get to heaven so you can have all these virgins and live in paradise. So what's God's response to all this stuff? Romans 124, so God abandoned them to do whatever their shameful, whatever shameful things their hearts desired. He just said, you know what, I'm not going to force anything on you. You can willingly serve me or you can willingly walk away because I'm not a God that is going to force you to be a robot and I give you free will. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. You see the, do you see the process here? They refuse to worship God for who he is. Then it starts to a dark and confused mind. And then it, it just, it never stops. We'll worship anything as long as it's not the living God. And then it gets to this point where God has abandoned them. He's taken his hand off him and said, all right, hey, do whatever your shameful heart wants to do. My hands are off you. Go for it. Run with it. I love you that much that I'll let you make your own decision and I'll let you live your own life. But know that I've made a way for you to come home. And so one of the signs that God has abandoned people and taken his hand off is the sexualization of a society. And we're going we're gonna to read through this. It says in verse 25, they traded the truth about God for a lie. Good is evil, evil is good. And anything but morality. So they worshipped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself. We've been there, haven't we? Idols in our life, things that we need to remove, priorities we need to adjust. who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So God allowed them to walk out on his blessing and reap the benefits of their own decisions. But can I tell you something? There's rules in life to protect us, whether we like it or not. There's railings on bridges so we don't fall off. There's a word of God to direct our life so that we make decisions that reap good benefits and not wrong ones. Because you, you can... <laughs> You can make any decision you want with your life, but there will be some kind of outcome. And it's either going to be a good outcome, you're going to reap good, or you're going to reap evil. Here's what happens. Verse 26. That is why God abandoned them second time. He's talked about abandoning them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned away the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. Les lesbianism. 
See it right there. So what's the process? Dark minds, confused, refuse to worship the living God, and all of a sudden, what is wrong appears to start being right. And we become confused in our whole idea, even about sexuality. That is one sign that God's lifting his hand and abandoning the people to do whatever their shameful hearts want to do. Second thing, the man, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, as a result, because we always reap what we sow. You reap to the flesh, you sow to the flesh. Or you sow to the flesh, you reap from the flesh. You sow to the spirit, you reap from the spirit. There is always ramifications. Burn for lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. As a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Did you just see that? There's a penalty that is included in that process of making those decisions. And man, as we look at society and as we look at things, this is uh, the, the Center for Disease Control said this, gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men are the population most, most affected by HIV in the United States. In 2017, adult and adolescent gay bisexual men made up 70% of the new HIV diagnosis in the United States in dependent areas. This is Center for Disease Control. So our government sees it. They know the stats. Matter of fact, in Iowa, when they were legalizing same-sex marriage, in Iowa, when the discussion was going on, the, the one thing that was brought up in some of the legislation was the fact that health care costs were going to soar to new heights because it's shorter uh, uh, homosexual men in these bisexual-type relationships. You have shorter lifespans, and they have more sickness and disease. And the Center for, Control, Center for Disease and Control is identifying this. And I'm going to show you another stat here in just a second. There is something that happens. There's a, uh, we, there's a reaping from the sowing of actions. And when we abandon God and his, his authority, which he's a creator, he knows what we need and what we shouldn't have. And he's established things in a way that produce good fruit, but when we walk out on that, we're going to reap bad fruit. And so we're, we're seeing that here. And I'll just show you the statistics here. GBT, uh, LGBT youth are two to three more, uh, more times likely to attempt suicide. This is the government stats, by the way. This isn't some, like, religious organization trying to paint a picture. This is just our government. Uh, LGBT youth are more likely to be homeless LG, uh, lesbians are less likely to get preventative services for cancer. Gay men are at a higher risk of HIV and STDs, uh, especially among communities of color. Lesbians and bisexual females are more likely to be overweight or obese. Transgender individuals have a high prevalence of HIV and STDs, victimization, mental health issues, suicide, and are less likely to have health insurance than heterosexual or LGB individuals. LGBT populations have the highest rates of tobacco use, alcohol, and other drug use. That don't look like ingredients for an exciting, healthy, fruitful, joyful life. And that's just what our secular science is identifying. There is so many, so many mental wounds that come from it. And oftentimes, it's a series of, of, of wounds that lead people down lifestyle paths like this. You know what, church? we, we got to reach these people. God loves them, too. God died for them, too. I, I, I do find some things that are extremely alarming as we, as we read through this. Uh, let's, let's read this next verse, Romans 128. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, like, oh, that's stupid. He abandoned them, third time, to their foolish thinking. Let them think how they want, and let them do the things that should never be done. Check this out. I want to introduce you to Eric Torres. Eric Torres in 2019 had a reading group to preschool, kindergarten type age kids in a library in Pennsylvania, and they're going on all over the place. They're in Brooklyn, LA, they're all, all your big cities, Chicago, transgender reading hour. Now, that's not normal. You can take a secular mind, completely remove Christianity out of this, and when you look at that, it just that's not normal. How far have we slipped if we call that normalization? And the reality is our society is trying to normalize that. Now, Eric Torres, we're called to love Eric Torres. 
We're called to reach Eric Torres. If Eric Torres came here today, I would hope that our church would embrace him and say, we love you, God loves you, God died on the cross for you, no exceptions. Now, we're not going to put him teaching our kindergartners until there's been a drastic uh, deliverance in his life. But God, we're called to reach everybody. We're called to answer questions of confusion. I had a kid walk up to me this morning, and he, and he said this. He said, Pastor Brad, I have something. And he was kind of intimidated to tell me. He said, I just struggle with Christianity. I just can't wrap my brain around this thing. You know, I said, man, I'm so glad you came to me. And you need your questions asked, answered. And I, I surrounded him with people and got some people involved in his life that can kind of answer some of those tough questions that he has about Christianity and about life and the things that he's learning uh, in, in other areas of life. We need to be a church that doesn't shoot our wounded but embraces those that need Christ. We're called to reach people, train them up, and release them into their God-given giftings. Now, it doesn't mean we agree. You know, one of the things that I hate, I hate the fact that all, all of these other cultural groups or these, these, they think just because we disagree with them that we hate them. Wrong. Wrong. Where did that play in? That's intolerance on culture's part. Because if they disagree with my standards of faith, then that means they hate me. Is that, is that where we're going in society? So now I'm a hater? Or it's hate speech? Because I disagree with your mentality or I disagree with your beliefs? Society and culture is dark and confused. Why? Because they've walked out on the things of God, and all sensibility becomes removed because we're called to identify with the King of Kings. I just want to read some of the stuff that uh, some of the parents wrote um, in regards to this, because this guy packed out a room. He said, they said, stop your hate. Drag is great. God thinks drag queens are fabulous. Love is love is love. Love thy neighbor. As a broader sense, of a look at the issue. Children-focused drag queen story times uh, have also hit libraries in Boston, Southern California, Brooklyn, New York, Chicago. One drag queen involved in pushing a story time reading for kids in Louisiana admitted that the events are meant to groom the next generation. LGBTQ activist Bear Burgum noted a similar sentiment in 2015 to the Huffman Post, Huffington Post. He said, I have come to indoctrinate your children into LGBTQ agenda, and I'm not a bit sorry about it. I'm here to tell you, and this is what he went on to say, I'm here to tell you that all that time I wasn't indoctrinating anyone with my beliefs about gay and lesbian and bi and trans and queer people. That, that was a lie, Bergman wrote. He said, all 25 years of my career, uh, since I was 16, when I was standing shaking, breathless in front of 11 people talking about my story, I have been on a consistent campaign of trying to change people's minds about us. I want to make them like us. This is absolutely my goal. The mayor and the city council members uh, in Pennsylvania in this town was also in agreement with this, with this event. And then come to find out he was a sexual predator and nobody had done a background check. Our eyes are blind to the very establishment and the rules that we put in place in order to try to appease. See, the reality is we don't have to appease a certain group of people. We don't have to agree with a certain group of people. We just, we're called to love everyone. We're called to reach them. Here's a picture of him having story time and then some of the other parents had some comments that they put in here. But I, I want to reference one thing that John Wesley said many years ago. He said, what we tolerate in our generation will be embraced in the next. What we tolerate in our generation will be embraced in the next generation. We are one generation away from calling this normal. Here's a 10-year-old boy who started a club, the drag club in Brooklyn in his school, in the school parade. Here's another little boy, his name is Quinn. He said, I got into drag when I was seven years old. Anyone can do what they want in life, he told LGBT in, the, in this interview. He said, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. If you want to be a drag queen and your parents don't like you, you need new parents. He said, if you want to be a drag queen and your friends don't like you, then you need new friends. And at 10 years old, he started posing uh, with nude adult drag stars. 
already just three years after his initiation of this. It's so sad to see that. I know of a divorce uh, going on right now. There's a custody battle, and the mom wants to transform the boy into a girl, and the dad is standing in, in opposition saying no. And it, it becomes a court battle. It's like these kids don't have a, the ability to make up their mind in these situations, yet we're going to allow parents to dictate the sexuality of a kid. What happened to biology? Our genes it's when God abandons a people to their own selfish ways that this stuff becomes normal in a society. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. This isn't new. It's been in the Bible throughout history. History always repeats itself. We're just in a repeating pattern. And you know what you can do? You can read the history and the outcome of those same people who had the same ideas and the same philosophies and the same morals, and you can see what our ultimate outcome will be as well if we embrace it. Why? Because history repeats itself. Romans 129 says their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, murder, envy, quarreling, deception, malice, behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand and break their promises. They're heartless, and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. So why do we want to serve any God but the God? Because of that. Because they know it's wrong. Because every single human being, despite what they say with their mouth, has a seed of faith inside their heart that screams, there's a living God. There's a living God. There's a living God. Worse yet, they encourage others to do the same thing. Can I just tell you, church, we're not called to encourage, coddle, embrace, and do all this stuff to make people feel comfortable I mean, Jesus certainly didn't make his family feel comfortable when he said, who is my mother? Who? He, he, he wasn't in for a popularity contest. And he said, the same persecution that I felt is the same persecution that you're going to feel. You're going to experience the same things that I did. Jesus was setting new standards and establishing a new covenant, and it created some crazy, crazy change of mentality. And that's what he was establishing and doing. We're called to stand for righteousness, and in the midst of standing for righteousness, we're also called to love all of mankind. Now, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but Jesus did it. You know who Jesus hung out with the most? Sinners. I would hope that we know some of the people in, this, uh, in, the, in the culture that don't know Christ, that have abandoned God in the, in the true sense of worship. I would hope that we're befriending some people and building relationships. I had somebody in the first service and they said, hey, this is what I do for a living. I work for the, I work for the government. They said it's extremely hard because you can't say anything, but, but it provided an opportunity at times when people would come to them and they, they would be able to say, you know what, God loves you. And these broken people would just begin to weep. And they said, I'm gonna do it as long as I can. Hopefully I don't get in trouble, but I'm just continuing to share God's light where I've been planted. People are hungry for acceptance and love. And that's what the LGBT movement's really doing. It's creating a community of love and acceptance. I, I want to challenge you Christians with three things this morning as we close. The first one is this, is as Christians, we need to set ourselves apart. Set yourselves apart. We don't condone sin. We don't flirt with sin. I, I've heard people say this, well, if I go out and get drunk with all these guys, then I, I relate to them, and then I can reach them more. Or if I go out and smoke weed with these guys, then I can feel connected, and, and we relate, and I have a, a greater witness. Can I just tell you that living a righteous lifestyle in front of people is more powerful than anything else? Getting involved in, in these, these sexual communities and stuff like that, it, it, engaging in that sin is not a way to reach them. The way to reach people is to live a life of morality. And people see something different about you, and they desire it, and they want it. Second thing is this. We must allow God to use us as a voice and stand for righteousness. We need to speak up. We need to stand for righteousness. It doesn't mean we hate people. Third thing and last thing is this. Church has to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. And I embraced the fact that young man came up to me at first service and said, you know, I don't really believe in Christianity. I'm struggling with this whole thought. Can you help me? Because he said, I know there's something out there. 
We need to embrace people who aren't okay. I can't tell you how many uh, students in youth ministry that I worked with that were struggling with homosexuality, and I even had one of them living with me. It's not about hating them. It's about trying to help them and reach people. We're called to be the light. And the church has to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. Otherwise, you know what they do? It pushes them out the door to groups that embrace them. And Jesus was the one who embraced them. Jesus was the one that welcomed them in. Now, there's some people out there that are just obviously in opposition, doing evil towards anything moral or that has to do with God. And we stand and we pray for those people and look for opportunities. But obviously, there's just some people that we're not going to be friends with. And that's okay, too. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. <laughs> that's so encouraging, Jesus. <laughs> awesome. I want, like, horns, though. Some sheep have horns. Just give me some horns so I can hit back. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. It's, it's truth, and it's never changing. It doesn't change based on culture. It doesn't stop and allow culture to take over. Your word stands the test of time. It has for thousands of years, and it will for thousands more if you tarry. And Father, I pray as we come into these last days that define this in 2 Timothy 3, that we would come to understand the incredible importance of the call of God on our life to be a mouthpiece for your kingdom. I pray that you'd give us boldness and courage. I pray that God, you'd help us to stand for righteousness, help us to love people who seem to be unlovable. God, I pray that you'd give us the heart of God as we look at people outside the church. I pray that we would weep for those that are broken. I pray we would weep for those that are hurting. God, give us a heart of compassion instead of a heart of stone. God, I pray that we never sit on a high horse looking down at other people, trying to be the judge of other people's lives, but instead embrace people with love and reach people who are hurting. God, may that be said of us. May that be our character because that's your character. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you a question with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because you've never submitted your heart to him. God is a loving God that wants a relationship with you. And it's just a mere change of heart saying, God, I welcome you into my heart. Would you join me in this prayer this morning? Say, Heavenly Father, I surrender my heart. I want to make you Lord. I thank you for the free gift of salvation that leads to righteousness in the eyes of God. I want to be your child. I want to be adopted into your family. I want an eternal home in heaven. God, I want to fulfill your purposes for my life. So help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we've got a little booklet we would love to give you, and they're available in the back. Al could give you one. Also, every Sunday morning during our 9 a.m. service across from the elevator, we have a room there in a class called Fuel that we'd love to help disciple you. It's a journey. It's a journey of changing how we think. Can I just encourage you with something for a minute? There's times through the week where maybe I struggle or you have a thought or you have a temptation or whatever it might be that you're going through, and what rattles through my brain constantly is Scripture. We need to be in the Word daily, and it needs to be the very sponge that scrubs our fleshly minds so that we do identify with Christ through, through holiness. Why? Because we reap what we sow. And when we, sow, when, we reap, when we sow to the Spirit, we reap from the Spirit. How do we do that? We begin to adopt the Word of God, quote Scripture. If you need healing in your body, you need to be reading Scriptures on healing every single day. You need deliverance from some, something, you need to be reading Scriptures on deliverance every single day. And we got people to help you with that. That's what Fuel Class is all about. So if you made a decision to follow Christ this morning, we want to help you in that journey and, uh, because we, none of us can do it alone. I have a mentor in my life that's discipling me and that's walking me along this journey. We all need uh, help spiritually in those areas.